Hi, welcome. I'm Carol Willis, and I am going to do a short introduction for our speaker for this evening, Richard Haw, who will talk about his new book, Engineering America, The Life and Times of John A. Roebling. But I want to mention briefly that this is an add-on to the series that you may or may not know about, Rewriting Skyscraper History, that we started last week. All of the lectures are available on our website, so you can catch up with the wonderful talks that, um, that we did have last week about elevators, grain elevators and passenger elevators, because we're exploring the last quarter of the 19th century and the origins of the tall building uh, in the urban landscape. When I had that topic and we set up the original semester's worth of lectures, which you can also see the coming ones on our, our, our website, uh, the idea was to explore technology, um, building materials, and the, the, the broad context of the changes in the 19th century, a time of incredible invention and innovation and urban energy and entrepreneurism. And at that point, I knew that we should be talking about the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, certainly the tallest structure in the landscape of New York, the cityscape of New York uh, by 1883 when it was completed, but through the late 1870s, those towers are rising um, out of the water and they were the tallest thing on, the, on the, the skyline of New York. So it was clear that we should include the Brooklyn Bridge in the series, but there, it, it seemed like we would be lingering too long without moving forward towards the office building, the development of the skyscraper. Um, but then I had the wonderful occasion to be able to go to the real physical bookstore of Rizzoli that opened um, at 26th and Broadway, reopened uh, just a, a couple of months ago, and I discovered this book on the shelves. Uh, and so it's a new book by uh, Richard Haw about the Brooklyn Bridge that followed two previous ones that um, I think he'll hold up for. Maybe Richard, how about a few props? <laughs> okay, <laughs> hold up your previous books on the, One of the um, art of the Brooklyn Bridge and a cultural uh, cultural history. history of the Brooklyn Bridge. This is uh, an art book. It's all a, a sort of compendium of about 260 images of the Brooklyn Bridge from artists, photographers, lithographs, comic books, you name it. Mm -hmm. And as he'll, um, and there was, a, and there's an additional book on the cultural history. Yes, of, which uh, is the, the impact of the bridge on various, uh, on New York and on the world. Yeah. So with those volumes under his belt, he turned, as he will describe tonight, um, to John A. Roebling, one of the pioneers of bridge design, um, and uh, you know, an incredible uh, innovator. Uh, and this make clear that we needed to have uh, Richard speak in, in the series and to fit him in between what were the broad um, innovations of the 1850s to the 1870s that we talked about last week with elevators and in between the rise of the skyscraper with the structural innovations of a transition from masonry buildings to metal buildings and indeed steel skeleton frames. Um, and joining us tonight is, our, is one of our speakers for next week, Donald Friedman, uh, who will talk about New York, uh, New York buildings, New York skyscrapers, uh, but we'll include him in the, a commentary and a dialogue after Richard um, finishes speaking. So let me briefly introduce Richard Haw, besides uh, his books, as the uh, associate professor in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at John Jay College, one of the, um, the CUNY system. And um, as an intellectual cultural historian, um, he began to investigate a topic um, very close to the heart of the Skyscraper Museum, engineering history and um, the rise of, uh, well, the rise of the skyline in the mm -hmm. 19th century and the rise of business as well. Yeah. So here's Richard Hawk. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you. Um, that marvelous introduction. Thank you for the, the, the crowd that's come out uh, today. Um, this is um, this is the first time my book came out a few uh, months ago. This is the first time I've had a chance to talk in front of an audience, uh, an actual live audience of beating hearts uh, since it came out. And I'm really glad and happy to see it's in bookstores and you can find it and pick it up. Um, so thank you for Carol uh, uh, and for Kevin to uh, helping me out and inviting me here today. Um, so I'm going to do, try and do uh, several things um, in this little talk. Um, 
I'm going to, I've written this book, so I'm going to talk, talk to you a little bit about uh, John Roebling, about his life and the sort of person that I think he was. Um, I'm also um, trying to, going to talk for a little bit about the impact of the Brooklyn Bridge uh, on New York and specifically in ways that correspond to uh, the impact of skyscrapers on New York. And I'm going to sort of end um, to try and try and speak to this ongoing series uh, that, that Carol is hosting about sort of late 19th century skyscraper history and specifically aesthetics in terms of the masonry and the steel, or the move from masonry buildings to steel frame skyscrapers. And so there's a section in my book uh, about how John Roebling thought about using masonry and steel in a single structure uh, in both the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge, but also in the Brooklyn Bridge. So I'm going to sort of read a section from that from my book to conclude. So hopefully be a part of this ongoing um, series of Carol. Um, it has, has, it had, it has started, uh, started last week uh, at the museum. And so just to uh, my book, um, just to uh, give you a bit of introduction, um, this is the first biography um, published about John Roebling in about 75 years. Um, and I've been, I suppose, as, as Carol says, I've been thinking about the Brooklyn Bridge for a lot of my intellectual, academic um, life. And I remember thinking, uh, I remember one of the first things I ever read was David McCullough's The Great Bridge, of course, uh, which was written in 1972, in which he says in there, in the, in the bibliography, that there is no first-rate biography of any of the Romans uh, at the time. And I remember thinking, that was quite odd. Um, and I think it sort of ref reflected poorly on what, what the, the record about Roebling was. So I often had in the back of my mind, maybe John Roebling would be an interesting person to write a biography of. And the more I got to thinking about the Brooklyn Bridge, the more I got to thinking about John Roebling, and the more I did think that he would be a really interesting person to research, write a book about. Um, and uh, I started that process about 10, 12 years ago. And it's true that we think about John Roebling as sort of steely and aloof, a bit starchy, uh, judgmental, a bit humorless. Uh, not helped, I don't think, by images such as this, uh, where he doesn't look, he does not look like a very jolly man at all. Uh, and um, so we, we think about him as, in this way that's sort of not particularly, uh, sort of not very vibrant in that respect. Um, but he is a genius and a visionary. I think in terms of engineering history, uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, suspension bridges at the beginning of the 19th century quite often fall down, or primarily fall down, and at the end they mainly stay up. And John Roebling is really a key figure in that transformation, in that sort of engineering triumph. Um, and so I think he's really interesting as a genius and a visionary. What I really most like about him is that he's also a bit of a fool. Um, he is the man that contracted tetanus at the Brooklyn Bridge building site and treated it with uh, the water cure unsuccessfully, as I think we probably all know. Um, and he's also a bit of a weirdo. Uh, he believed in all sorts of strange things. Um, he believed in odic force, which I'll let you go to the internet and, and Google that one. Um, he tried to fight off cholera by marching up and down his bedroom, shouting, I have it not, I have it not. Uh, he believed that the afterlife consisted of seven spheres of existence, uh, the final one, which he slowly worked through uh, to get to the final sphere, which was called Summerland, which sounds really awesome, actually. Um, but he had all these things, and I think what stood out to me about John Rogan thinking about them all these years, and then doing all this sort of research on him, um, was this contradiction, um, especially within the realm of things like science. Uh, Rogan could wrestle thousands of tons of wood, granite, iron, and steel into beautiful and intricate monuments to humanity's capacity for energy and vision, combining advanced mathematics and physics with the eye of an artist and a master craftsman. And he also believed in spirits, wrapped himself up in a wet sheet before going to bed most nights, assiduously attended seances, uh, more or less avoided nearly all fruits and vegetables, which he thought were kind of toxic, um, and believed the judicious application of water to the skin could draw out bad humors and poisons. Uh, this is a guy that, in terms of, I think, under the broad rubric of science, uh, he was both a visionary and a genius and a complete quack. And so how you sort of uh, think about that, that seemed like a problem was worth pursuing and trying to solve. Um, and I think what I learned about John that was just as remarkable as all this is that he was a man who thought about the world, about the th world in which he lived. Uh, nowadays, in terms of, we think of engineers as being quite specialized. Now, they, 
Uh, think about engineers as closed off from broader social questions, selling their skills in metallurgy and mechanics to whoever has a requisite financing, but that wasn't always the case. And I don't know this about people who were involved in building skyscrapers in the 19th century. Well, I don't know enough about that side of the engineering history to say much about this, but certainly a lot of um, engineers in terms of uh, canal engineers, transportation engineers, and suspension bridge engineers, civil engineers, um, saw themselves as address addressing in the 19th century what you might call the problems of civilization uh, rather than simply the problems of physics. Um, they wrote, they wrote about specific problems they faced in their work, about the impact they hoped it would have on the world. They had vigorous debates about education, about municipal politics, urban problems, and so much more. Uh, we are quite used to thinking of artists, writers, and politicians as the like as intellectuals, but we tend not to do so with engineers, uh, who were the very people that were involved in building the whole environment about in when which all this thinking got done and about which most of that thinking involved. Involved. Uh, what did the, what were these engineers thinking? They what did they think they were doing? Um, such a man was John Roebling, and I'm going to put a, I'm sick of looking at the starchy German picture there, uh, so I'm going to put up a slightly better, this is about as good as John Roebling gets in terms of uh, the images of him, he doesn't, he doesn't come across very well uh, visually, um, but this was the sort of man that John Roebling was, he wasn't just an engineer, um, he thought about how engineering would affect the world, he was a deep reader of philosophy and an engaged social critic, railing against slavery as early as 1831, um, and he wrote significantly about distributive justice during the Civil War as well. He's a man who saw connections between things, between technology and society, between building things and building a better world. He saw railroads, telegraphs, suspension bridges, all the great works of connection, uh, for example, as great works of technology and of moral advance, as physical things embodying functional design and philosophical principles. Much like Walt Whitman, in fact, John believed that the endlessly repeatable forms of modern technology could bring about a more perfect union. He believed in a future made of iron and steel, molded by engineers into a world of unity and equality. Uh, one of the reasons I call the book Engineering America is he thought uh, he was an engineer and he engineered things, but he also thought about how society could be engineered in some respects. He was an engineer on, he thought about engineering as a a broad social sort of question. Um, so I'm just going to trace the broad outlines of his life, which you can do quite quickly, uh, really. Um, John Roebling was uh, born in the medieval walled town of Mulhausen uh, in Thuringia um, uh, amid the Napoleonic Wars. This is actually what Mulhausen looked like, and it was drawn by John um, in 1825, I think. Um, and uh, as you can see, John was kind of a polymath. He was quite, he was quite an artist. He was a deep reader of philosophy. He was very good with languages. Uh, he was an inventor, a manufacturer, and an engineer. He was a man who thought about lots of different things. And this was an image he did when he was about 18 or 19 years old. Um, and you can't really see down here, but it says down here, it's printed by uh, his cousin. He had a cousin called Ernst Roebling, who was a printer in town. And this was... Um, uh, drawn by John and printed up by his cousin and sold about town. This actual image is from the Mulhaus Museum um, in Germany. Um, at 18, uh, John left Mulhausen, which is really a very sleepy and provincial sort of place, uh, and went to live in uh, Berlin, uh, where he attended uh, the Prussian Build Building Academy, um, which was the, the foremost center of engineering and architecture in Prussia at the time. Um, he uh, it was in Berlin where he learned primarily about suspension bridges, or he heard about suspension bridges for the first time, uh, taking a course in bridge architecture, and um, one new part of that was a, a new section on suspension bridges. This is uh, an image from his student notebook from 1826, I think, um, and this is the Hammersmith Bridge in London, uh, which had just been constructed in 1825. Um, John's time in Berlin, again, is sort of interesting. So he goes to Berlin to train as an engineer, um, but he also takes, uh, he takes classes in art at the uh, art school in Berlin, and perhaps most famously um, pays uh, to attend Hegel's lectures in logic at Berlin University, now Humboldt University, I think. Uh, and so even though he had a full slate of engineering classes and he was there to study as an engineer, 
He took extra classes in art. He took classes in philosophy with a famous philosopher. Obviously, when he went to uh, Berlin, he knew who Hegel was and had read Hegel, which uh, he was only in his early 20s. I also, he also took classes in French as well, um, at, and that was with a private tutor. So he, he packed a lot in. Um, after a year um, in uh, a college in Berlin, uh, he headed off to Arnsberg in Westphalia to work as an engineer uh, building roads for the state. Uh, he stayed for three years and he gained a, a really excellent education in all sorts of practical uh, engineering uh, issues. He built small houses, he built roads, he built culverts, he built small bridges. Um, he became a really excellent uh, practical civil engineer. Uh, perhaps the most interesting um, part of his time in Westphalia is that he designed two suspension bridges. Um, both of which were rejected, they were for competitions, and at the time, uh, everything, all building projects um, were adjudicated by uh, the Prussian Council, Higher Council of Architecture uh, in Berlin. So you would submit, anyone who wanted a bridge or something built, uh, there would be a competition, you would submit a plan, um, and they would uh, be adjudicated. Uh, John didn't win either of uh, the uh, competitions. Um, the, Germany were very late to suspension bridges. Suspension bridges were really, really popular in France, and they were quite popular in Britain, uh, but there was very few in Germany. Uh, the ones that they did have in Germany often catastroph catastrophically failed, and so uh, the higher council of architecture were really quite conservative um, and frowned on suspension bridges as a sort of novel, um, potentially catastrophic um, feature. But John's um, plans have recently been unearthed uh, in Germany in the last few years. And a lot of modern engineers have looked at them and said, oh, it's not too bad, actually. It would have stayed up. Uh, it, was, it was quite good, quite advanced for its time. Um, and the reason I mention all this is that he, he, John uh, came up with these two plans having never seen a suspension bridge in person. Uh, he, he had read about them uh, in his classroom in uh, Berlin and um, had studied them, but all the literature on them, but hadn't seen one in person. He didn't see one until uh, he visited Bamberg in 1830, two years after he designed these bridges. Um, John actually never returned to Berlin, uh, and he never finished his engineering degree, and he had one year of engineering college. Um, he returned to Mulhausen in 1828, uh, and soon met a man uh, called John Etzler. Um, and the two Johns became friends, and Etzler had been in, in the North America, and he'd come back to Germany uh, to recruit um, young Germans to lead a sort of uh, expedition back to the U.S. and create a sort of German settlement uh, in the U.S. Uh, John uh, Esler became quite famous a few years later when uh, the two Johns did come uh, and uh, came over to uh, came over to the U.S. Uh, in 1833. John Esler published his book in Pittsburgh. This is the London edition, but it was originally published in Pittsburgh. The Paradise Within the Reach of All Men. And we still think about this book um, as uh, and refer to it. Um, for, for one, one major reason. Um, how are we going to reach the paradise within the reach of all men? We would all stop working, uh, and all the work would be done, uh, all the energy, um, we would develop machines that would rely on uh, solar power, sun power, wind power, and tide power. Um, and so uh, John Etzler is now sort of understood to be the first green technologist. Um, uh, but it, the, the trouble with Johnson, he had all great ideas, but his machines never worked. And so um, he sort of went nowhere eventually. And his, his life is super interesting, uh, but I, I won't divert you. But the two Johns, uh, John Etzler and John Robing, founded the Mulhausen Immigration Society in 1830. And they set up in the US with a whole bunch of supporters or people who were going to uh, come with them uh, in 1831 in hopes of establishing a communal farming settlement um, somewhere in the interior of the country. Um, unfortunately, the two Johns fell out on the journey, and very common for nearly all of these sort of um, communal settlement um, uh, societies, everyone fell out on board, and they all went their separate way when they got to Philadelphia. Um, John um, made his way out to Western Pennsylvania with his brother Carl, uh, and bought 1,600 acres of land um, in Butler County, uh, and founded the village of Saxonburg, uh, which is still there. Uh, this is the earliest image we have of Saxonburg. Um, and this is from 1835. Um, doesn't look, um, it's perhaps the village equivalent of John himself, it doesn't look very jolly. Um, but this was um, done by a local artist and sent 
Again, it's printed by Ernst Roebling, uh, sent it back to Germany and used perhaps as a, um, a sort of um, promotional tool. John had founded this village and needed people to come over and buy it, settle it. And so uh, he was very active writing letters back to Germany to try and get people to come over um, and uh, live in, in Saxonburg. Um, John uh, uh, set up this village and sort of tried farming and he adapted very well to his new country. Uh, he already spoke English by the time he got there. He worked very hard on English, learning English. And Western Pennsylvania was full of Germans, and so uh, there was a lot of goodwill there for him. Um, so he adapted to his new country very well. Uh, he adapted to his new life terribly. He was an awful farmer by all accounts. He tried farming, was terrible, couldn't control anything, couldn't grow anything. Uh, and slowly, during the late 1930s, uh, he returns to engineering. He works on the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal. He works on the Sandy Beaver Canal. He conducts railroad surveys. He was an excellent surveyor, by all accounts. Uh, railroad surveys um, for the state uh, of Pennsylvania. Um, his big sort of, the big change in his life comes in 1841 when he hit on the idea of making rope out of spiraled wire, a notion that made his fortune and helped change the course of his adoptive country in, some, in, in a large measure. He got the idea traveling on uh, the Allegheny Portage Railroad and reading the reports of its daily, of its yearly uh, traveling budget. Uh, inclined planes such as this um, were just taking off in the US and were used to drag people and raw materials, mainly coal, up and down mountains. Um, the Allegheny Portage Railroad was a, a part of um, the uh, Pennsylvania Mainline Canal. The canal went all the way up to the foot of the Allegheny Mountains, and these inclined planes would uh, pull. Um, these uh, the barges up and down and over the Allegheny uh, railroads. Uh, they were very popular, very well remarked upon. Dickens wrote on them and wrote a lot about them. Um, really interesting. Um, they didn't last very long. But they were very interesting and sort of novel solution to a, a, a specific problem. Um, they, uh, they used traditional hemp ropes uh, made of fibrous material initially, uh, and which were costly and inefficient. They didn't last very long. Um, rope made from spiral wire lasted much longer and was adaptable to many different uses. Uh, crane, rigging, cranes, derricks, uh, elevated planes themselves were the forerunners to uh, funiculars, uh, cable cars, and even elevators. You can see this image from Mount Pisgah. Uh, you can, it's not, that's basically a funicular. It looks like a cable car a little bit. And you can see it's only a hop, skip, a jump from that to pulling elevators up and down skyscrapers. Um, um, all of these uh, forms of transport exploded onto the American landscape in the mid to late 19th century, uh, and all, nearly all of this wire was supplied, supplied by John A. Roebling's Sons Company, uh, which was the largest single manufacturer of wire rope in the U.S. until well into the 19th century, in, well into the 20th century. Roebling ropes pulled elevators up and down new tall buildings, making possible thousand-foot-high skyscrapers in New York and Chicago held up suspension bridges of prodigious length from the Golden Gate to the Hudson River, drove mass, tr mass transit cable car systems in thousands of towns all over the US. All of this and more flowed out of the industry John set up in his backyard in the 1840s. Um, the real turning point for this for John was that his wire rope business uh, really made his money and liberated him to become uh, more than a working engineer, to become almost like a gentleman engineer. Um, Engineering was not what put food on the Roebling household tape, uh, his, his wire rope business did, which means that he didn't have to grub around for jobs, doing any sort of engineering job that came around. He could pick and choose uh, what he did and what projects he undertook. Um, and with his income secured, John uh, devoted much of the rest of his professional life to building suspension bridges, which is, which is what he's most famous for. Uh, in nearby Pittsburgh, he built the Allegheny Aqueduct Bridge uh, in 1845 and the Monongahala Suspension Bridge the following year. Uh, this is John's plans for the Monongahala Suspension Bridge. Um, between 1848, uh, 1848 and 1852, he built four suspension aqueducts in upstate New York uh, for the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company, the largest of which, which is in Lackawaxen, uh, still exists, now retrofitted for cars, the oldest suspension bridge uh, in the US. There it is. Um, and this actually has gone through um, various metamorphoses over the years. Uh, in the 1980s, the National Park Service uh, dug up all of John's plans and rebuilt uh, the, the flume of um, the bridge um, to 
replicate what it would look like for a canal. It looks like a canal aqueduct now, uh, except you drive along it rather than being filled with water. Uh, all of this uh, uh, woodwork is new, but it's almost exactly what the bridge would look like, as I can show later when it was built. Uh, the suspension cables and most of the metal work are original, and so that classifies it as the oldest suspension bridge in the world, uh, in, in the world, uh, in the U.S. Um, his great triumphs, John's great triumphs, were the Niagara Falls International Suspension Bridge, uh, which was built in 1855, or finished in 1855, which was um, the first uh, fully functional railroad suspension bridge uh, ever built, and probably the only railroad suspension bridge that's ever really worked. Uh, and that has been a, it, the, suspension bridges don't work well with uh, trains. Um, but it did work very well for about 40 years, um, and some trains got really extremely heavy, um, and the bridge started to deteriorate. Um, the Covington and Cincinnati suspension bridge uh, finished in 1867, which at the time uh, was opened as the longest suspension bridge in the world, and was also interestingly the first structure to link the north with the south after the Civil War. Uh, it was begun actually uh, before the Civil War. Um, in between, uh, he built the St. Clair Street Bridge in Pittsburgh, which I'll show an image of later. Uh, in 1859, he finished that. Um, and he was at work on what would have been his masterpiece, the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, when he was felled by a tragic accident. And, just... and so, what we'll talk about next is the Brooklyn Bridge a little bit, and the impact of the Brooklyn Bridge um, on New York City. And I think the first thing to say is it's almost impossible to overstate the impact of the Brooklyn Bridge on the city of New York at the time it was being built and the time it was built. Um, it has fascinated and inspired and influenced just almost everyone that comes to New York, from artists and poets, uh, advertising executives, uh, politicians, uh, architects, civic leaders, urban planners, you name it. it, has, it, it it's, it's a sort of civic ideal, uh, but also a sort of aesthetic ideal in, in lots of ways. It, it's, it's, it's most people's favorite built thing in New York, or many people's favorite built thing in New York. Um, and, I, and I'm going to talk about just the impact of the Brooklyn Bridge in terms of it, how it corresponds to skyscrapers. So I think the most important thing uh, to sort of say initially um, that the bridge was really a gargantuan, almost unimaginable leap forward in the history of engineering and technology uh, in the city. It was, in terms of its length, uh, a, a, a half times again as longer as long as uh, the, the, the other, the longest suspension bridge at the time. So this was 1,500 feet between uh, between the towers. The Covington Cincinnati Bridge uh, was 1,000 feet between the towers. So it was half again as long as the next longest suspension bridge, and so much longer than almost any other bridge. I mean, so much longer, but like by half again as much uh, as any other bridge uh, in the world. Um, its towers, when they were constructed, uh, were the tallest things in North America. Um, you can see them here in the process of being built, um, and they're not even finished yet, and they just loom over everything else around it. I mean, the, these, the towers were really New York's first skyscrapers. Um, and what I, what I actually kind of find interesting about this is the way that this sense of the size of them was often exaggerated in the press. Um, this is actually from a Scientific American, which is normally we would think of as a, one of the more accurate uh, of the illustrated magazines in terms of architecture and engineering in the 19th century, but this is World Trade Center stuff. Um, this is um, you know, so far above the rest of the city. This is Trinity Church, and I think the bridge was taller than Trinity Church, but not by that much. By, yeah, like 10 feet, 6 feet, something like that. Um, but here it's 500 feet above uh, Trinity Church. And so there is this sense that the bridge uh, has this massive impact on them, but it's also amplified. Uh, through visual representations of the bridge. Um, we see here a lot of these sort of uh, bird's eye panoramas that were done in the 1870s and early 1880s. The bridge again is just this huge thing towering over the city um, and really um, dominating the city, giving a sense of uh, the scale of this new type of building that we're dealing with. Um, Again, this is a, an image again from the, before the bridge has even begun. It's from the towers looking down on the city, giving a sense of really how tall it was and how tall it seemed. Um, 
This is uh, one of my favorite anecdotes of this is that if you were, um, if you spare coppers in your pocket, uh, you could bribe some of the workmen to let you uh, walk over. This is the, the, the walkway that they used to help spin the cables backwards and forwards. The workmen would be positioned on there uh, to make sure the cables were being spun accurately. And a lot of people, really excited by this new thing coming up, going up in New York, uh, took, uh, tried to get on there and have a look over, but they got, they got up there and they froze. Um, and they couldn't, they were over, overcome, overwhelmed by the size and the height of this. And a lot of them had to be walked off. And it ended up, this, this practice was eventually uh, banned because more workmen were helping rich snobs get off the bridge uh, than actually doing their work. Um, and so, um, again, so the size, of, not only did it seem big, but people who went up there were sort of frozen, terrified. By what they by what they found, um, in terms of sort of technology engineering, uh, the bridge is the first. Um, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge is the first suspension bridge to use steel, uh, Bessemer steel uh, cable uh, in its construction, and in, in its net respect, sort of uh, a testing ground for steel uh, wire rope. Um, that um, again is new sort of form that would. Um, lead to elevators um, and ultimately the skyscrapers are steel frames and skyscrapers. Uh, but this is one of steel's first great testing grounds is in the Brooklyn Bridge. And you see again the cable structure of the Brooklyn Bridge there. Um, and this is a sort of interesting image um, from around the time, just before the Brooklyn Bridge is open actually. Uh, so, and this is by Thomas Nast who's very famous for doing all those images of Boss Tweed with the money bags and the Caesar stuff. Um, and it seems to be sort of suggesting that the, the Brooklyn Bridge here is sort of some sort of uh, is, is pointing the way forward to this new city that's going to rise in the 19th and 20th century, uh, a city of masonry and built on steel, but a city of height. Um, a city. This is the sort of the idea that New York, once we've got the Brooklyn Bridge, and I guess uh, the, the other skyscrapers that are going up around the same time, the city is just going to grow and grow and grow. Um, and we see the sort of impact of the relationship between the Brooklyn Bridge and the idea of the city to come. Um, the last thing I just want to mention in terms of the bridge's impact um, is sort of electrification. You often think of skyscrapers as electrified icons of New York. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, New, the, the Brooklyn Bridge was the first electrified icon in New York. Um, Thomas uh, Edison here, his uh, generating power station on Pearl Street opened up in the 1870s. 1879, I think, somewhere around there, uh, and it was right by the Brooklyn Bridge, and there was actually quite a fight uh, between Thomas Edison and Charles Francis Brush um, to be, uh, to get the contract to light up the Brooklyn Bridge, to electrify the Brooklyn Bridge when it was opened. And actually, Edison didn't win, Brush won. Um, and this isn't, this isn't necessarily the best image, but it's, it gives a sense that the, the, the Brooklyn Bridge was the first electrified icon in New York, and really that the promenade of the Brooklyn Bridge on certain nights was the first sort of great white way. Uh, that the city had um, predating Broadway. Broadway was still a few, a few uh, maybe years or decades away in, in how we think about it as the Great White Way. Um, and so, I just want to conclude by um, talking a little bit about um, John as someone who thought uh, John as an engineer who tried to think like an architect, or that, that was capable of thinking both as an engineer as an architect and blending. Um, masonry and steel into a sort of architectural vision uh, as well as a sort of engineering triumph. And so I'm going to talk about John as a designer uh, for a little bit um, to conclude with. Um, John's design for the Brooklyn Bridge, which is really the sort of culmination of his work as an architect, um, is sort of the culmination of what might best be described as a sort of uneven aesthetic development. Uh, none of his designs for his previous bridges were able to marry function and expression anywhere near as well uh, or as successfully as the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, his Monongahala Bridge, we saw a, a dark architectural drawing earlier. This is what the Monongahala Bridge looked like in the photograph. Um, his Monongahala Bridge was pure utility, drawn up as a retrofit hurriedly. In consequence, it looks and is more or less what it was. Uh, this, this is a, built, uh, a bridge he built on the ruins of an old bridge after the Pittsburgh Fire of 1845. Um, and he had to build it very, very quickly and use the existing piers. So it was sort of like, throw it up, make it work, 
for John. Um, John's aqueducts uh, were likewise exercises in sort of really serviceability, uh, where much of his work was hidden beneath a huge wooden flume, uh, and they contained neither adornment nor artifice. This is the bridge uh, that I showed earlier when it was working as a canal. You see the canal coming in, and then the canal boats going over. And you can see how similar the work is now to what it was, uh, but you really can't see much. It's, it's, it's designed as an aqueduct and not much more. Um, his Niagara span, uh, John's Niagara span, 1855, Emote the mystery and timelessness of Egyptian ancient monuments, uh, but all the stays radiating, radiating out at the bottom uh, suggest sort of uncertainty, maybe even fragility, as if a carpenter had finished his work and then banged in a whole bunch of extra nails just to make sure. Um, which, in, in large measure, is what happened. Uh, all the stays were added. This is a windy spot. If, if anyone's in any doubt, you can imagine that. Um, and uh, previous to uh, this being built, the wheeling suspension bridge had been swept away in a gale, and after that happened, John added all these stays to the bottom of the bridge just to make sure, but it sort of ruins the aesthetic in some way. Um, John's next project, uh, the St. Clair Street Bridge in Pittsburgh, is none of the moderation that marked his previous work. The span is overworked and overly ornamental, as if John was striving to make something beautiful and attractive simply by adding features. Uh, there's just too much going on there, and too much too little proportion. Um, the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge begins the be represents the beginning of John's maturation as a designer. Uh, and this is an image just after it was opened. Um, like a lot of uh, 19th century bridges, and the Brooklyn Bridge is a good example of this, and so is the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge. Um, they've been retrofitted for uh, modern traffic and heavier traffic. Uh, and so the, the Covington Sanity Bridge just doesn't look like this anymore. It's, they added extra sets of uh, suspension cables, they added a big uh, truss system at the, uh, around both sides, um, and the Brooklyn Bridge is very similar. The truss system that dominates the lower half now and sort of blocks the views uh, was added by David Steinman in, in the 1950s. Um, but with the Covington Sanity Bridges, uh, the first time John grappled with the issue of how to integrate masonry and iron. Uh, an architectural problem virtually without precedent in the United States. It wasn't possible to construct metal towers of sufficient size and strength uh, when he began the bridge, leaving John with two very different types of materials that were at odds visual and technologically in some respects, uh, yet also worked together to keep the bridge up and running, the towers and the cables. How to think of them as a single piece of architecture um, a single piece made up of complementary parts forced John to think in ways that went beyond traditional engineering. He needed to build something that worked and that meshed visually. He needed integration. It is, difficult, it is a difficult task to produce a proper architectural effect when designing towers for a suspension bridge of large dimensions, he wrote. Highly ornamental masonry may be built, but it looks out of place when the general impression should be that of simplicity massiveness and strength. Equally, however, quote, a public work which forms a conspicuous landmark across a great river which separates two large cities, both abounding in highly ornamental facades, should also serve as a model of appropriate architectural proportions. Public works should educate public taste, he wrote. Therefore, some expense ought to be incurred in order to satisfy the artistical aspirations of a young, and growing community. Such ideas led to the Ohio Bridge's most prominent flaw, perhaps as far as I'm concerned, uh, the superfluous small towers that sit, uh, superfluous small spires that sit across the towers, uh, while highlighting John's great aims and the bridge's great strengths. Uh, this is a slightly uh, similar image uh, of the bridge after it was constructed, with you can get a better sense of the towers on the top. Uh, the Moorish embellishments are at odds with the Romanesque arch that otherwise defines the towers. Overall, they seem that the, the Moorish embellishments seem to exist as if John felt he had to put something up there in an effort to reflect the highly, highly ornamental facades of Cincinnati, while the span's evident strength is achieved through simplicity of design and proportion, and without an overwhelming sense of bulk. What he called, what John called, strength combined with lightness and elegance. He achieved this with what he called a finely tuned arch, as you see there, airy yet artistical, without detracting from its function, and through his use of buttressed walls. Medieval architecture is, dis is distinguished for its remarkable lightness and great strength, 
owing principally to the judicious use of the buttress, he explained. Such themes found a parallel with his cables, themselves remarkably light, yet possessing great strength. The cables, of course, related the towers to the roadway, providing a thematic link. Neither should be allowed to overwhelm the other in appearance, and neither could the roadway, which itself is considered in a design process. Without stays and trusses, the elevation of the bridge floor would be too light in appearance as compared to the massiveness of the towers, John noted. And it is, as it is, the whole has a pleasing effect and at the same time presents some strong and reassuring proportions which inspire confidence in the stability of the work. Balance was the key between all the elements. When successfully achieved, it would advance and educate public taste. John's East River Bridge design continued this work, uh, refining and clarifying his aesthetic. And this is a really the best image we have uh, that represents John's vision for the, for, the, for the Brooklyn Bridge. It was the image that he worked this up um, as a big um, uh, image with William Hildebrand, who went on to work on the bridge uh, with his son Washington, um, as a sort of image or a, a representation or a vision uh, that accompanied his initial proposal to the City of New York and the Board of Trustees. Uh, so this is the image that he drew up in 1867 when he did his initial uh, proposal to the city. Uh, gone are the embellishments in favor of a more holistic, uh, pared down and expressive approach. He retained the prominent use of buttresses and swapped out a Romanesque arch for double Gothic arches, which add size, symmetry, and thematic coherence. While Gothic and Romanesque are both arch medieval architectural styles, the former is far more in keeping with a buttressed wall than the latter. Gothic arches and buttressed walls are also an aesthetic form and an, architecture, an engineering technique. They both grow out of the medieval desire to stretch upwards towards the divine, best exemplified in the great Gothic cathedrals of Europe. Visually, they move the viewer's gaze upwards just as the building itself rises upwards. They combine this with a wonderful iconic sense of a gateway, the bridges, the bridges towers as a gateway, the great arches as a passageway and an entrance to an inspiring, maybe even spiritual place, a feature that brings the bridges roadway and elevated promenade into play, linking the vertical with the horizontal, the masonry with the steel. Uh, the famous painter Joseph Stella who painted lots of very famous images of the Brooklyn Bridge when he uh, walked across the Brooklyn Bridge in the 1920s. He wrote an essay about his experience, uh, and he talks about as he approached the bridge's tower, he felt on the brink of a new divinity. Uh, the sense of it, the bridge is sort of a religious place, uh, referenced by the medieval architecture. Um, it is from the walkway that one best experiences the bridge as a portal, but also the web of cables that speak to the geometry of the city rising behind the bridge. And I think this is kind of interesting. This is a, a lithograph from uh, uh, Richard Nevinson, uh, who was a British artist, uh, but he sort of wonderfully captures the way that the, the cables reference the buildings behind it, that the geometry of the city skyline uh, is uh, seen through the bridge's cables, and that the geometry, one geometry placed over another. Um, the cables also, of course, um, draw one's attention uh, back to the Gothic arches, leading up, leading one's gaze up. Everyone who's walked across the bridge, you, get caught in this sort of matrix of the web of the cables and you instinctively look up towards um, the, uh, the height of the towers, um, what a uh, heart crane called the web and altar of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, this is an image by, a uh, famous image by uh, Walker Evans done in 1929. Um, walkway cables, towers, John's plan calls for architecture and, en and engineering to exist in harmony. He designed his last bridge as, quote, a principle of order, subsuming form, function, history, and culture, refracting and reflecting our experience of passage and revelation. Unlike much of the work of the Gothic Revival flourished in the US uh, from the 1940s onwards, John's use of the motif sought to put an old style to a new use. It is forward-looking, not nostalgic, a fact noticed immediately by the Soviet poet Vladimir Mayakovsky in 19... In 1825, uh, Mayakovsky's architonic masterpiece, Brooklyn Bridge, his poem, uh, called A Shout of Joy, uh, rather wonderfully by Colin McCann, portrays the bridge as an arbiter, as the meeting ground of the past and the future. 
standing on what he called this steel-wrought mile where, quote, my visions come real in the striving for structure instead of style, Mayakovsky saw the future unfold, the dynamism of steel unfurling out through both time and space into a new future, flowing from and taking the, past, the place of past achievements. Many followed the poet's lead, celebrating John's design with infectious enthusiasm and giddy abandon, especially the combination of masonry and steel. Uh, the best example of this is perhaps Marion Moore's poem, Granite and Steel, uh, but also Thomas Wolfe's uh, novel, The Web of the Rock, um, and there are dozens and dozens of great modernist paintings uh, that juxtapose the steel uh, and the granite uh, of, the, of the cable and the towers. Um, other people did not follow this lead or did not uh, enjoy it quite so much. Henry James called the bridge a monster, uh, a quote, colossal set of clockworks, a steel-soled machine room of brandished arms and hammering fists and opening and closing jaws. But James, of course, almost never liked anything new. And this was perhaps the point. The Brooklyn Bridge was and was intended to be something new. A fact that stymied Montgomery Schuyler, who wrote the first serious architectural consideration of the bridge to mark the span's opening on May the 24th, 1883. And Schuyler, I think, is also interesting because he wrote um, quite extensively about the creation of the New York skyline uh, in the late 19th century. Um, Schuyler liked the bridge as a piece of engineering, and he hated it as a piece of architecture. Most of his complaints focused on the towers, which he felt referenced old forms whilst disguising its contemporary use. The trouble for Schuyler was that he had to invent a rather unfair conceit in order to get there. Imagine a scene in hundreds of years, he wrote, when a future archaeologist might happen upon a ruined and deserted New York. Should he discover the bridge, its cables would most likely have rusted and fallen into the river by that point, leaving just the towers. With this scene before Schuyler's imagined voyager, could he decipher the functions of these lonely sentiments? Schuyler didn't think so. On their own, the towers expressed nothing of their function, that they were there to shoulder four large suspension cables that held up a mile-long roadway. As the first critic to recognize the bridge's significance, Schuyler deserves credit, but his criticisms seem unfair and beside the point. John designed the various parts of the bridge to balance each other, to work in harmony. To take away any part of the balancing act is to shift the terms on which it is designed. One wouldn't uh, dream of assessing King Lear while taking out one or more of the daughters. Uh, one wouldn't consider falling water without thinking about its natural setting. Um, one also might say that what the hell else might two gateways in the middle of a river be but a bridge? Um, so I'm not sure I agree with this guy or any of that. Uh, but he did, he did think he did think long and hard about the bridge. Um, and he wrote, uh, perhaps one of the most famous things that's ever been written about the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, it so happens that the work which is likely to be our most durable monument and to convey some knowledge of us to the, mo rem to the most remote posterity, wrote Schuyler rather disparagingly, is a work of bare utility. Not a shrine, not a fortress, not a palace, but a bridge. John ironically would have been overjoyed with such an assessment. The present age is emphatically an age of usefulness, he wrote. The useful goes before the ornamental, he continued, and is only through such an understanding that, quote, a higher spiritual culture, spiritual culture of the masses can be attained. In this sense, he continued, the advancement of sciences and the various arts of life may well be hailed as the harbingers of good. Its labors are our friends, not our enemies. The works of industry will soon be broadcast over the surface of the earth, and want will disappear. John cared not a fig for shrines or palaces. Neither were useful. Neither were harbingers of good. Neither would solve the problem of want. Neither advanced the higher spiritual culture of the masses. Uh, as Dave Billington wrote, and I use David Billington because he wrote both about bridges and about skyscrapers, um, John believed the spirit was uplifted by understanding technology and by creating out of it superior works that people can afford, and that they can openly use, and that they can aesthetically use. These were the meanings he tried to weave into the final design of his bridge. It was the same message he wove, albeit obliquely and esoterically, into much of his life. These were Roving's ideals, 
and his principles. Thank you. Thank you. Richard for an incredibly Thank rich you. and you. you know wide-ranging talk. So many topics to take out of the menu of the life of Roebling, and he seems to be an endlessly fascinating character. I, I can, think so. I can see why you would want to work on him and spend so much time. Uh, but of all those things that we could talk about, it seems like now, in the short amount of time we have for the Q&A, would be a great, a great idea to speak about engineering mm -hmm. and the subject that you raised about the relationship between skyscrapers, the innovation in the, in the 1870s. And we just happen to have our speaker for next week as well here, um, a, a neighbor in Battery Park City who is able to amble over here, uh, Donald Friedman, who is a structural engineer and the author of the very soon to be released uh, Structure in Skyscrapers, as well as uh, a number of previous books, most particularly Historical Building Construction, which has come out in a couple of volumes um, and highly recommended. Don is the expert on 19th century technology of skyscrapers, and so, uh, as, as well as the history of technology and engineering. So from his professional perspective, as well as his academic uh, credentials, I thought it'd be great to have a conversation between Don Friedman and Richard Haw. So I'll get out of the way and let them talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just, I, I very much enjoyed the talk. Thank and you. The, the first thing that sort of jumped into my head while I was listening to you was that um, John Roebling and bridge engineers in general are used to their work being on display. Mm. And Roebling's thoughts about aesthetics, for example, come out of the fact that everyone is going to see his mm. work. Whereas the engineers who, who got involved with skyscrapers starting sort of in the 1880s knew that their work would be hidden, that you mm. could see the effect of it in yeah. the size of the building, but you couldn't actually see it. And there was actually some discussion of this in the engineering press that you know people don't understand what engineers are doing with tall buildings because they can't see it. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any. Uh, no, I mean I think I, I mean John thought of his, his of his bridges. I think I think it's a really interesting point that I, I had never really thought of. Um, John thought of his bridges every, as with everything with any sort of engineer, um, and I think John's a good example of this. Is everything was evolving and ongoing. Um, and so um, it's really where he sort of ends up, where you see John Clearest. Um, but he saw his bridges as profoundly social spaces. Um, he talked about the Brooklyn Bridge, the elevator, uh, the elevator promenade. And the elevator promenade is really clearly uh, the real triumph of the Brooklyn Bridge, is that, is that walkway. Um, and the way it is designed with the cable structure and the towers. Um, and he said, he, he thought of it um, as an incomparable place in a city like New York. Uh, sort of as a new Broadway, or, or a, a sort of a place like Broadway that people could go for to get clear of the city in some respects. So it's not quite like a Broadway in that respect, um, but it was a place where people would go to take a walk, uh, to get get the air, take the air, uh, to see other people. Where the city could mingle and see each other, um, and so he certainly understood um, the bridge as a place um, where people would congregate, gather, uh, use it. Not, not just to transport, I mean, the, the Brooklyn Bridge really fundamentally changes uh, the relationship of Brooklyn to New York. Uh, in, and it fundamentally changes the sort of transportation history of the city in all sorts of ways, uh, as well as the political history of New York. Um, as soon as the bridges, uh, I'm going off topic a little bit here, but as soon as the bridges uh, begun, the, the discussions for the consolidation of the five boroughs into one city uh, begin. Uh, but John certainly saw it as more than just an avenue where people would ship goods backwards and forwards, which is primarily um, the debates about bridges, uh, the bridge between Manhattan and Brooklyn, had, had been going on for a long time because there's no way to get to Manhattan except on a ferry. Um, and so getting livestock in and things like that was a real pain. Um, so much of the debate about building a Brooklyn Bridge centered on getting goods in and out of the city. And John understood that to be one of the reasons uh, why you would build a bridge, but he did understand it as a social place where people would go for a walk, in the same way that people understood 19th century cemeteries as a place you would go for a walk, uh, to take the air, um, and to mingle with the city, to get out of the city, um, and to, he said it, he called it a great promenade in the air. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure that he had 
all of that in mind when he desired the designed the aesthetics uh, of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, he, he designed his bridge, as you say, to be on display. Uh, there's a lot of things that are sort of um, hidden in that. So uh, in terms of, um, say, he doesn't, he doesn't build his bridge with a sort of uh, a trust system, but he tries to use the various forms of the bridge to do the work of engineering. Um, so he designs his sort of side rails and things kind of to hopefully work a bit like a truss. Um, but, they're, so they're, but they're not fully, they're not full trusses, which come a bit later. Um, but he uses everything to be both, he tries to, he tries to sort of use everything, like you say, he, use, he, he designs his bridge to be seen, to be used, to be a social space, um, and that combines sort of that with an engineering perspective. Uh, and I think we were talking about this earlier, the sense in which he's trying to be both an engineer and an architect at the same time, and they involve different things. Um, and I think, you know, my idea of Madison Street skyscrapers is that all, all the work of getting them up there is hidden, but there's a lot on display in the facade. Uh, and so there's sort of, a, there's sort of um, the, 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 the fact that sometimes engineering is hidden when architecture is on display. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely the way I think structural engineers see things today, is mm -hmm. that, you know, it's our job to fill in the blanks in what the architect has drawn. Yeah. Um, but what, what's sort of interesting with skyscrapers that are being built um, simultaneous with the bridge, mm -hmm. so the, the 1870s skyscrapers, the, the early 1880s, mm -hmm. the very first group of, of yeah. these tall buildings, uh, is, is that there was very little engineering in them at first. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the architects are designing a form mm -hmm. and they're relying on masonry walls working the way they've always yeah. worked. And Brodling's career it, it's, is very much analytical engineering mm -hmm. um, on, on the bridges. So that switch of uh, tall buildings being actually analyzed for gravel mm -hmm. and for happens, it's, it's starting to happen as the bridge is being finished, but it really gets going later than that. Yeah. So you have this, this sort of drift of engineering concepts from bridges into mm. uh, into buildings. Um, as I and is that is that also the case with, I mean, the, 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 the sort of uh, bridges in the late 19th century, there's a real transition to trust bridges, which must have a relationship to steel frame skyscrapers. Am, am I right in thinking that? Or? It, it's in the direction is from bridges to the buildings. Yes. Um, and what, what happens is that uh, particularly railroads fixate on um, truss bridges as being the, the largest capacity, easiest to build, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Uh, under the, the circumstances of that era, which mm -hmm. was that there's no welding, so you have, it, it, it's more labor intensive to build up very big members, yeah. and therefore if you build a truss with smaller pieces, it's easier. Yeah. Um, and uh, any number of people who worked on early wind brace skyscrapers and mm -hmm. making that distinction because not all early skyscrapers actually had wind bracing um, would describe the, the the bracing as it's a bridge truss and uh, there's a one quote it's a bridge truss stood on end <laughs> um, you know so yeah. they're, they're using an engineering concept that everybody had seen even if they didn't understand it they mm -hmm. people knew what a truss bridge looked like yeah. and saying that's what's hidden inside the building and holding it up yeah uh, and that gave a certain level of comfort that these things weren't just, you know, oversized chimneys. There, there was actually a metal frame. Inside. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, you, you had said, you had talked about the Wilhelm Hildebrand's mm -hmm. uh, role in the bridge. Yes. And I, he is actually one of the, the few engineers as early as the 1870s that you can point to and say, well, he's taking uh, bridge concepts and using them in the building because mm -hmm. he designed the, the very large train shed at the first Grand Central yeah. train station for, for mm -hmm. the New York Central Railroad. Um, and and it, it's interesting because he designed it around 1871, which is during the construction yeah, of the absolutely. bridge. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I'm wondering, actually I don't know the answer to this, but I'm wondering how many engineers, architects trafficked between the two mediums. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about that later. I, I don't know how we would ever find out the answer to the questions. <laughs> why we need to talk about it. Anyway, well, thank you very much uh, for, for this talk because it is a, it's a different view on topics that I think everybody has heard about again and again. We've heard about John Roebling and, and the, the Cincinnati Bridge and the Niagara Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge, 
but how he got to the point where he was designing these things is a story that isn't as well known and I think um, has a lot to say about, about 19th century America and how, how we got to where we are now. So, Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for helping. I think I should say that this is a wonderful bridge to next week when Don Friedman and Thomas Leslie will talk about the early uh, technology of construction in New York and in Chicago. So please go to our website, RSVP there, and um, join us next week. And if you don't have a chance to do that, you can always catch up on our website after the events are concluded. They'll be posted within a day or so and available on our website, which is skyscraper.org. Thank you.